DF. There's all sorts of things in life where basically you have a high concentration, you have a low concentration, and you have a migration from the high to the low. Okay? Um, I don't know. There's so many. Here's a practical one. Say you're driving down the road between towns, and, and this, this, this town has gas at maybe $2.50 a gallon. Right? This place over here has it at a um, dollar ninety. That's basically a force. It's a gradient. It's a difference between prices. It's going to force you to go. You have all sorts of different, uh, different gradient forces. This is just a pressure gradient force, pushing air to move. Now, my question is, and this is just for my knowledge when you're unanswered, um, you have greater wind than there's higher force. Right, and we here. talked about that, I think, on Monday. But yes, we said basically the stronger the difference, mm -hmm. okay, the stronger the wind. Yep, we talked be about that. Inverted to where it's lower on one side and not as high with the winds shift, or, or um, it's going to be a high. It always will go from high to low. Okay. Yep. <coughs> so one of the things we need to talk about, and I've kind of got my days mixed up, but my 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 night class and my day class, but we need to talk about once wind is created, these actually are the things that are going to kind of move it. It won't go in a straight line. The Coriolis force, I get to kind of talk about the Coriolis force. Everybody loves the Coriolis force. Okay. Um, so I think I'm going to skip those, skip those hot, hot things. But remember when we talked about um, isotherms? We said basically, we talked about the word iso just means that basically you are looking at one thing, whether it's pressure or temperature or, or wind and you are making a line, a contour line, to connect locations with that same, okay. So isobars are connecting locations with the same pressure, okay. And actually, I think I have some pictures coming up. So this actually goes to what, um, what Joe was saying a minute ago. Um, here's the deal. If you look, and we're going to see, we're going to look at some isobars here in a minute. But if you have isobars that are like this, okay, and let's just say, let's go from high to low, and let's say we're stepping down at, you know, this is 1,000, I don't know what's a good thing, but 1,015, what does MP stand for? Millibars, we talked about that on Monday. Okay, um, so we're stepping down, so this would be 1,010 millibars, let's go with units of five, I think usually it's units of four or we're going to go five. This would be like 1,005 millibars. Okay? So that is one situation. And consistent with this, basically, we would expect a wind to go like that. Right? I want to show you another scenario where, again, we have high here and a low here. I'm going to go ahead and drop it down from 1,015 to 1,005. But drawn to scale, this is my 1,015 millibars. This is my 1,010 millibars. This is my 1,005 millibars. Okay. So here's the deal. For this scenario down here, I'll call that A. For scenario A, I only have to go this far before I get five millibars change. Okay. For scenario B, I have to go this far. I get a five millibars change. So basically, we have this is what we call a steep PGF. And PGF is one of the things you're going to want to get under your belt. What does PGF stand for? It stands for difference in pressures. You have a steep pressure gradient force. So actually, our wind here, I'm going to go ahead and change the length of my arrow because that's kind of showing you the wind. I'm going to make it a long arrow. Steep pressure gradient force, long arrow. A windy pressure gradient force, short arrow. Okay. And so you've got more, you've got more distance to go ahead and change from 1,005 to 50 millibars to 1,005 millibars. The wind will be windier, which could be a good thing, unless you try to fly kite. Okay. So what I just showed you actually is what this is talking about. This would be A. The more closely spaced the isobars, the steeper the pressure gradient. The steeper the pressure gradient force. Okay. That means, like I showed for A, 
you don't have to go very far before you get five millibar change. You're like, dude. Okay. So we're going to look at um, a couple of weather maps. I found them in my notes. You might only, yeah, you have two. I think they're like the same. Very similar anyway. Okay. So. I guess we didn't talk about this on Wednesday, on Monday. Okay. So, for instance, then, this spacing is pretty large. Again, it's not five, it's four. I don't know why they go units of four, but they do. You'll see these isobars, and on the isobar, it will tell you what pressure it is. So, all of this pressure is 1,016 millibars, all of this pressure is 1,012 millibars. It's a pretty big space, so this would be like B. Okay. This over here would be like A. Notice that they're closer. They're still in increments of four millibars. In all cases, it's going from what? High to low, in all cases. Okay. So, and it's kind of standard to draw, to show how strong the wind is by showing the length of the arrow for the wind. So here it's weak wind, short arrow. Here it's strong wind, long arrow. Okay. So this actually, I, I'm having a hard time with, um, actually maybe I did I make on the next slide, finding a website that actually has a, a good contour line, good isobar. Um, the telecast used to do better than they do now. But, um, for, so a few things. Can you see the H and the L, right? So it should make sense to us. Let's see if it does. Let's see if from the H's, Let's pick on the H first. Okay. Let's see if from that H we should be stepping down. So the closest isobar is 1,036 millibars. The next one, 1,032 millibars. And the next one, 1,028 millibars. So yeah, that's cool. We're stepping down. So, and I'm going to have to try to say why this isn't, but it seems like we should have wind going like that, okay? That seems like what we should have. I'm going to show you how it's kind of twisted because of the Earth spinning on its axis of rotation. All right, so let's look at the low. Okay, so if it's a low, we should be stepping up. Okay, so let's see. All these locations are at a pressure of 996 millibars plus 4. 1,000 millibars, plus 4, 1,004 millibars, plus 4, 1,008 millibars, okay? Yeah. So high or low? How many people think that the low should have the strongest winds because of the spacing of the isobars? Me too. You are totally right. So the other thing that's on this map are like little flags that say what the wind speed is. So basically, okay, it, it didn't make it, sorry. So, oops, but basically what it is is the more the flag, the merrier, no, the more the flag, the darker it is, the, hot, the higher the wind speed. So you're right, this is kind of showing you high wind speed. And yeah, you need this to kind of cross-reference. Oh, okay. Do you have it here for this one, though? Yeah. Okay, good. That's good. It's kind of the same scale, I think. So this is, like, to me, the same. I don't know why I have those two slides in there. But I am going to go to current maps because I played around with it, and I told you I was trying to find, and I went back to good old National Weather Service. So... Some spring breaks we've had, and the weather was just terrible. Give me four inches of snow. They're calling for snow? No. We're, we're, we're done with snow, we decided. Peach Tree, Georgia. Yeah, so I know, right? So I think I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll throw this up on the Twitter feed, but I can't remember which one I like. This says surface map because one of the things, and doesn't this make sense, that what the pressure is here is different than what the pressure is up here? 
Okay, so these are surface pressures. Um, okay, not bad. Better than what I've been finding. So this is currently the real deal. Um, it's uh, March 11th. But kind of like we saw before, when you see the H's and the L's, what's the same thing about this L as it was in the other L? You guys told me that there's more wind around the wall. The wind is stronger. Usually, and it looks like a bullseye sort of thing. Okay, and that's really characteristic. Lows, pressures, um, that usually has a steep pressure gradient. And highs are kind of blobby. They look like the high is blobby. So that was pretty good. All right. So I'm going to put the word local wind up here. You might want to get it in your notes. The video we watched, I think, talked about a local winds and global winds. Local, not loco. The word local and local wind kind of means it seems like a close wind, and it is. Local winds are much smaller than global winds, but they can still be pretty big. Okay, So this is an example of a local wind. And let's see if we can find, see if we can kind of think through why this wind happens kind of locally. By the way, um, I'm going to describe it in terms of something called a sea breeze. And, but you may, if you've ever visited Chicago, you may have experienced about 3 p.m. kind of the wind whipping around the skyscrapers, okay? And that actually was because, not the sea, but it was because of Lake Michigan having the same effect that the sea has. The other thing about local winds when we talk about them in, in a later chapter is if you want to know where it's blowing from, look at the name in front of the word wind or breeze. So sea breeze is blowing from the sea. Okay, the lake breeze is blowing from the lake. So here's how it works, and you're going to see on the figures coming up. The thing about whether it's Lake Michigan or an ocean, okay, one of the things we talked about clear back in Chapter 1 was basically, like your swimming pool, those large bodies of water don't want to heat up, and they don't want to cool down. They take a lot. There's a lot. Okay. So every day when, when the sun comes up, okay, the sun shines on the ocean or the lake, and the sun shines on the land, okay, the land goes ahead and responds and heats up, the oceans, not so much, or the lake, not so much. And actually, there, in a nutshell, is what kind of we have created a difference in pressures. So, back on Monday, I said that actually, do you remember warm air tends to have a low pressure, and cold air tends to have a high pressure? So what does that done? Basically, you have a high pressure out here over your lake or the ocean. Okay, You have a low pressure here because it's nice and toasty there's your breeze. That's it. And that's what these show you. So this is actually showing you at dawn. Basically everything's, you know, kind of calmed down. We basically have these. Now these are vertical isobars, okay, not horizontal. Basically saying pressure is decreasing like that. Uh-huh. You're talking about the ocean currents, uh, the ocean being sluggy, but mm -hmm. uh, it's a little cool, right? Right, because it's a specific now, heat of water. In terms of global warming, would the consistency of the increasing temperatures cause the North Atlantic or uh, the Pacific current? I don't think we'll probably get to this. If we do, it'll be later on when we talk about climate change. But, yeah. This actually is happening on an everyday scale, and, kind of, and I don't really want to go to the whole year-to-year, -year, you know, decade-to-decade -decade scale kind of you're talking about. It's more but just every day. Okay. But doesn't this also occur, you use bodies of water too, but can it also do, like right now, 93% of the uh, Great Lakes is covered with ice. Now, I mean, I'm not I'll take your word for that. I haven't looked up that statistic recently. Uh, but. but can it heat up and cause the excess of the wind on land too? Because bodies of water, because it's already cold. Yeah. But see, a lot of like Chicago, uh, Detroit, Cleveland, all them get that lakefront effect from the wind. Right. Even with a bottle of ice, is it the same? Well, I think the thing, you can you can apply ice here if you want. I think it works with ice or I think it works either way. Because what I'm saying here is this actually has, and I'll show you the third one. This actually is showing you where basically we have a low pressure here because it heated up more quickly. You know, this could be ice. 
Again, ice okay. is cold, liquid water is cold. Yeah. So because it's cold, I'll put the word cold out here under that H. The H doesn't stand for hot, it stands for high pressure. And that was one of the things that, you know, you need to know to kind of have this all make sense. Uh, let's see what color. I guess I'll try this color. This out here is cool, and this is hot. Okay? We talked about hot creates a low. Okay? Cool creates a high. Okay? So then actually that's how you have your lake breeze or your sea breeze. Yeah. But now I hope this doesn't confuse you too much. So basically, during the day, we have a lake breeze or a sea breeze. And to me, I don't know if this you buy this, but if you don't, I was thinking about this just now. If you don't have the sun, all bets are off. If you don't have the sun shining on, on your land and on your water, you cannot have a sea breeze. Okay. Your, uh, your uh, lake effect wind in Chicago, you know, you can have the urban, uh, you can't have the urban island heat effect either. No sun. This is what I was thinking. No sun, the right? And yeah, no sun. You're not going to have that difference. Yeah. Um, so here's the deal. Remember, I said look at the word before the word lake or breeze. Or sorry, look at the word before the word wind or breeze to know where it's coming from. So if somebody says it's a land breeze, you ought to say, dude, it's coming from the land. Where is it going? To large body of water, whether it's Lake Michigan or the sea. Okay. So at night we have the opposite thing going. At night, if the sun's been shining, basically that water's got a head start. It's kind of toasty. So basically, over a large body of water, I'm going to put warm out here, and I'm going to put cool here because your land's going to cool down faster than your um, large body of water. So with cool, remember, we end up with a high pressure, and with warm, we end up with a low pressure. So there you go. <coughs> it's what we call an outgoing breeze. So it's kind of nice. Um, all right. Oh, this is a good one. Okay, so um, this is horizontal, okay? Going up like that, that's called vertical, okay? So vertical. So the thing is, is we've been talking for a while now that basically as you climb a mountain, the air gets thinner. <laughs> so as you climb a mountain, basically on the top of that mountain, you can put a big old L up there, okay? We have an H down here. The air is pretty thick. Okay, high pressure, low pressure there. Well, that's a vertical pressure difference, okay? So we've been talking about basically from high to low, that's basically going to create a wind. So honestly, it seems like we should have an, oh, an upgoing wind all around the Earth, okay? But it doesn't go like that, okay? And what balances it is actually gravity, okay? So this balance between the impetus of high pressure air to want to go straight up because it's lower pressure, okay? The thing that balances it and then the fact that wind, that air does not relocate itself is gravity. And that's called hydrostatic equilibrium. And it has to do with, I have some good pictures coming up. I used to draw it, but I'm like, hey, let's just go on the internet and snag a, snag a picture. It has to do, and it's, and it's actually why the, um, it's why we don't have Here's my globe. <laughs> Hydrostatic equilibrium. It's why we basically don't have wind going straight up, <laughs> going from a high to low pressure. But sometimes we do have, sometimes we do have, uh, and I'll use the word updraft. I don't know if you know, remember I used the word updraft before. I think I probably used it when we talked about basically if you have condensation up here and your little liquid water particles want to fall down from the base of your cloud, they have to overcome this gentle ongoing updraft. So there is an updraft, gentle updraft. In the case of cumulonimbus clouds, storm clouds, all bets are off. Basically, the instability associated with that chunk of air, you definitely do have uh, vertical motion. Okay. All right, so here are my pictures. Let's see if you like them. So. I'll put an H down here, the bottom of that first arrow, and I'll put an L at upper elevation. So this is my high pressure, because we know air is thicker down here, we have a high pressure. Here's my low, we have thinner air up there, we have a low pressure. Okay, so that's, that's the vertical pressure gradient force. Vertical, I can't spell vertical. I spelled that way this time. Okay, and gravity balances it out. 
Again, the length of the arrow is trying to indicate the kind of the magnitude of the force. The fact that the length of those arrows are the same show you that they're kind of balancing each other out. The other picture I have is this one. Okay, just kind of very similar. So that upward tendency would be from, because we have a high pressure here and a low pressure here, this downward tendency is just because of gravity. That chunk of air is in between hydrostatic equilibrium. Sounds like a great vocabulary question, doesn't it? I think so. Could be. What's that? I don't know about that. I have to think about that. I don't think so. Yeah. The, uh, the impactor? Um, no, I think it's a different thing, Pete. Yeah. Now, gravity was a player for, for reforming our moon from the fragments. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't think there was any high and low pressure, and that's kind of what we're talking about here. But definitely gravity was a player. Sure, that's gravity. That's awesome. But there's no pressure of force gradient there. So, yeah. <laughs> and that's kind of important to this conversation. Yeah. Okay. So we're focusing on the difference in the vertical... What happens to that moisture is caught in that balance? What's that? What happens actually to that moisture? Nothing. It um, stays there? Yeah, that's the point. Does it's it basically to, for, does it cause more humidity in the air? Or no. The when the hydrostatic equilibrium is in place, basically we, aren't, we don't have vertical wind. <laughs> when it's unbalanced, like we have with cumulonimbus clouds, it's this cool. No kidding. If you were to stand under a cumulonimbus cloud, your updraft, you would actually... So for storm clouds, there's this thing called inflow, and they talk about this in Storm Chaser. Basically, there is a wind that is feeding your cumulonimbus cloud. There is an updraft, dude. So that's where they're not in, it's not the, the vertical uh, pressure gradient force is not balanced out by gravity. Basically, it's one out. Okay, so your chunk of air will move. So that's why some planes avoid certain patterns when they're flying because of the uplift. And yeah, the updraft, yeah. Okay, let's see, what else do we have? Nothing to avoid storm clouds to avoid lightning. You know that's very, very well. <laughs> All right. So it's created, wind is created in the first place because there's a high and low pressure, and basically that air wants to move from a high to a low pressure. Um, we talked about the tighter the isobars, the stronger the pressure gradient force, and the stronger the wind. Okay. So now one of the things I want to talk about um, is this idea of why doesn't, remember a minute ago this, the, the surface maps had an H and an L, and I said, you know, why doesn't basically um, air go straight from the H out and straight towards the L? It actually has what we call this spin, and the spin is actually because the Earth is spinning, okay? And that's actually called the Coriolis force. <coughs> What? The Coriolis force. The that's Coriolis the spinning. force, or the Cor well, it's not the spinning, but the or spinning actually creates something called the Coriolis force or Coriolis effect, and it's a little bit kind of um, playing with your mind a little bit. It's what we call an apparent deflection. It's an apparent uh, rotation because it's not real. So I have some pictures of the Earth here in a minute. We have a non-rotating Earth and a rotating Earth. Now, the Coriolis force or the Coriolis effect only works if you have left the Earth. Okay, If you're still on the Earth, the Coriolis force does not work. So things that have left the Earth include critters that are flying in the air. Now, the problem with critters flying in the air is the Coriolis force only works also, this is one of the rules, if basically the bird is flying a long way or if the bird is going very fast. Okay, If not, then Coriolis force is out. So, so here's the deal. This kind of apparent deflection, which kind of makes a curviness, in our half of the Earth, in the northern hemisphere, it is to the right. And I get my rights and lefts mixed up, so you'll just have to kind of bear with me. But what this means is if I am wind going from a high to a low pressure, because of the spinning Earth, I'm going to go like this. Can you see where that's to the right? <laughs> it's the same thing as it splits it to 
southern hemisphere, if I remember correct. One will go clockwise, the right. other will go counterclockwise. And that's why I have the southern hemisphere is to the left. Um, okay. So, non-rotating Earth. Thank goodness our Earth rotates because kind of like what Keith was saying, if it didn't rotate, it wouldn't have the this, uh, the sort of momentum we need to actually stay on there. Right. It would not be good. Also maintaining the but, hotels. Yeah. So the Earth is spinning, but let's say the Earth's not spinning, and let's say we have a jet that wants to take off from the North Pole and go towards the equator. Okay, so it left the Earth, okay, if the Earth isn't spinning, and the line of longitude we picked on was 90, so, let's see, here's 90. Oh, that's the other hemisphere. Okay. Yeah, right here. So this is 90, so basically, if the Earth's not spinning, it's going to end up at the equator, okay? Earth is spinning. Earth is rotating. So instead of ending up at the equator, okay, the Earth was spinning counterclockwise, okay, so it actually, when it landed, it landed down here at 105. Okay, it started at, at 90, okay, started at 90, was going straight, and it did go straight, but it landed here. That's why it's an apparent deflection. Did the plane go straight? Yeah. Did it look like it curved? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's the apparent deflection. You can also see it in nautical, nautical charts. Yeah, I believe that. So it would still be on the Earth that by all well, accounts. They just, they told us when we jumped out of planes and stuff like that, everything moved to the right when you jumped. Oh, okay. Because the Earth's rotation. Oh, well, I don't know about that, but I believe you that's what they said. That sounds good. But so here actually is looking at deflection two, but you're trying to stay on the same line of latitude, not longitude. So here's the deal. So the plane takes off, trying to stay on 60 degrees latitude, and actually it ends up, again, appearing to deflect to the right. That's at 60 degrees latitude. Now, as we go closer to the equator, of course, those are lower latitudes. Check out the deflection. It's frozen. No, it's not. OK. So notice that at 60, we have the greatest deflection, 60 degrees latitude. Um, at, 30, at 40 degrees latitude, less deflection. At 20 degrees latitude, less deflection. If we're at the equator, and this kind of makes sense to me, if you're at the equator, you take off, the Earth spins, you land, guess what? No deflection. You land, no deflection. So the thing about the zero latitude, the low latitudes, there's no Coriolis force. There's no spin. So that's one of the rules of Coriolis force. So yeah, we are bumping up against the clock. So we will start here on Friday. I think I'm already in the next week. Oh my God.